dark matter is one of the big, amazing, exciting, unsolved mysteries in astronomy today. Dark matter. When we're studying something like astronomy, you know, we learn about all these, all the data we have, all these theories, all this wonderful stuff. It's easy to get the impression that we know everything. You know, we know everything there is to know. Any question you can ask, we got it all figured out. But the truth is, what we know, I mean, okay, what we know is big compared to what we didn't know a hundred years ago. But what we know is small. What we know is tiny compared to the enormity of what's out there. I mean, in, in astronomy, we're studying the universe, the whole universe. And what we do not know is vast compared to what we do know. So we have to talk about dark matter, one, because it's really interesting, but also to emphasize that there are so many huge, giant, big questions about astronomy that we really do not know the answer to. So. Dark matter. The basic idea of dark matter is that the, the matter that we can see, ordinary matter, stars, planets, gas, dust, the stuff we see with our telescope is just a tiny fraction of the total amount of matter that's out there. Maybe roughly, say, 10% of the total amount of matter in the universe. And the rest of it out there is something that we don't know what it is. So dark matter says there's 10 times more mass out there than just the stuff we see. Stuff we see with stellar telescopes. You know, stars, gas, dust. This is, or these are all organized into galaxies. And that what we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. That the vast majority of the stuff in the universe is out there and we have no idea what it is. All right, so what's the evidence? Science is all about evidence. So what's the evidence? The first evidence for dark matter uh, started back in the 1930s, 1930s. There was this awesome, really cool, and just eccentric as all get out astronomer. His name was Fritz Zwicky. Fritz Zwicky. Zwicky. I'm probably misspelling it. Whatever. Dude was German. He came over from Germany into the United States because, well, let's face it, the United States was a more pleasant place to be in the 1930s than Germany. So, as a result, I mean, America benefited colossally during the 20th century because, you know, there's all this horrible stuff going over in Europe in the you know, first half of the 20th century, wars and stuff like this. So what happens, you get these tons of these really smart people come over here, which was a great benefit to America. Anyway, he made all these crazy, amazing discoveries. He was involved in the idea of supernovae and neutron stars, all kinds of stuff. And this is one thing he's doing. So he's studying clusters of galaxies, studying galaxy clusters. Now, galaxy, several hundred billion stars, like the Milky Way, several hundred billion suns held together by gravity. And then a galaxy cluster. Well, now you got a bunch of galaxies orbiting around each other. And often you have hundreds or thousands of galaxies orbiting around each other. So what does Fritz Zwicky do? He, he does something which is relatively straightforward. He uses the most important equation in all of astrophysics in order to Newton's version of Kepler's third law in order to estimate the mass of a galaxy cluster. But he estimated the cluster in two ways. Uh, estimated, mated cluster mass. So what does he do? Well, first of all, he uses Newton's version of Kepler's third law, the most important equation in all of astrophysics. Basically, he looks at these, these galaxies and he says, ah, well, this galaxy is mm, this number of megaparsecs from the center of the, or kiloparsecs probably more, from the center of the cluster. This is how far it is from the center. And, oh, this is its orbital speed. So it's just like if I want to measure the mass of the sun, what do I do? I figure, well, the Earth is this far from the sun. The Earth has this velocity. Oh, therefore, the gravity from the sun, the sun has this mass. That's what's going on here. So Fritz Wicke uses Newton's version of Kepler's third law. He uses galaxy speeds. How fast is this galaxy going? So using the Doppler effect, red shift, blue shift, light waves getting stretched out as things move away from us, light waves getting compressed as they move towards us, and that allows us to measure, we, as we look at how much those absorption lines or emission lines coming from the galaxy have shifted to the right or the left, that tells us the, the galaxy's velocity relative to the cluster, and then, and distance from the center. And so he does this out, he calculates his number, and he's like, wow. These galaxies are screaming. They're going at colossal speed. They're moving really fast as they orbit around their cluster. That tells us this cluster must have an enormous amount of mass. And then he measured the mass using another way. He simply added up the number of galaxies. Added up 
the galaxies. We know the mass of an average galaxy. Ratio based on its light. Oh, it's a bright galaxy. It's about this. If it's about the size of the Milky Way, it should have the mass of the Milky Way. So he added up the masses of all the galaxies, and then he matted up the the, 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 the then he used speeds and distance and Newton's gravity stuff in order to figure. And the answers he got, I mean, they should match up perfectly. Yeah, maybe this misses some stuff, you know, but they, they should be somewhere in the neighborhood. And the answers he got were totally, totally different. The answer he got from galaxy orbits, the speeds of the galaxies that are moving around there, uh, telling him there's ten times more mass than just the mass of all the galaxies there. So he's like, well, good grief. If, I mean, you know, a factor of two, 20% more, you know, they shouldn't match up exactly, but 10 times more? Holy cow, there must be 10 times more stuff there than just the stuff we can see. So what is it? And so based on this, Fritz Wicke says, that means this galaxy cluster is mostly something else, not galaxies. And there's 10 times more stuff out there. And everybody at this point, Fritz Zwicky was a man of great self-confidence, is a nice way to put it. There he is, a man of great self a man of high self-esteem. Um, other astronomers thought, he, something's got to be wrong here. We, I mean, they just barely discovered galaxy clusters. Something's going on, so his, his result was basically ignored. And so this happens, Fritz Zwicky does this. This is interesting. There's 10 times more mass than... The galaxy. So what else is out there in a galaxy cluster other than galaxies? I mean, that's, that's the problem. So this result is ignored for 30 years. Next big person in this story, her name was Vera Rubin. And she and her colleague uh, Kent Ford are working in the, the, the late 60s and 70s, stuff like this, 60s and 70s. And she's studying now not clusters of galaxies, but the orbits of stars within individual galaxies. Stars orbiting within galaxies. And she discovered, she and her colleagues and all this discovered something amazing. And she did a lot of very careful, very thorough work. I mean, just awesome science. Science is about the details. Science is about being careful, measuring things precisely, exactly, carefully. And her data was just so beautiful, so flawless, that there was nothing to nitpick. Um, you know, there's nothing slapdash about this. Man, it was just right down the numbers. It was so inarguable that it kind of took the whole astronomical community and forced them to pay attention that there's something going on here. So she's or st stars orbiting within galaxies. So here's, here's the basic fact. In a galaxy, most of the stars are at the center. You add up all those things, you know, the, the central bulge of a galaxy, there's just tons and tons of stars there. So here's the, here's the central fact. Most stars are at the center of a galaxy. You know, the vast majority of stars are in, in their central, general, bulgy sort of region sort of thing. Good. See, most of the mass is there. Kind of like our solar system. Our solar system, you know, most of the mass is the sun. Not quite that high a proportion, but again, most of the mass is the sun. And so what happens? If you study the orbits of the planets, well, Mercury orbits the fastest because it's closest to the sun and feels the strongest force of gravity. Then Venus is second fastest and Earth is third fastest and Mars is fourth fastest, yada, 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 because gravity gets weaker and weaker with distance because most of the mass in our solar system is the sun in the center. She says, look, in a galaxy, most of the mass is also in the center, so let's measure the velocities, the orbital velocities of stars at different distances from the center. So she's measuring, measuring uh, star speeds, the speeds of stars, as you get far and farther away from the center of the galaxy. So you make a plot. You make a plot. So here's distance from the center, and here's the speed. Now, if you do this for, like, planets in our solar system, well, there's a nice curve that goes down there based on Newton's laws of gravity. Planets get slower and slower and slower as you get farther from the center. But if you plot it out for galaxies, like, you know, Milky Way, nice spiral galaxy, what you get is you get something that's basically flat. We call this a flat rotation curve. What this means is that a star like our sun, you know, it's orbiting around the center of the galaxy. Well, its orbital speed is basically the same as other stars, which are much farther away, and is the same as other stars, which are much closer. It's still going to take the closer stars less time to make an orbit because they're moving in a smaller circle. But the speeds, 
the speeds, if all the mass is in the center, the speed should decrease. As you get out there, it's as if like you're looking at the solar system, you find that, hey, Mercury orbits at the same speed as Venus, Venus orbits at the same speed as the Earth, and Mars and Jupiter, and that wouldn't make any sense at all. Gravity gets weaker with distance, and so orbital speeds decrease. But Vera Rubin and her colleagues, through a series of very careful, just meticulously good papers, showed that no, in galaxies, when you look at other galaxies, again, they're using the Doppler effect and all this to, to measure these velocities, and they get a flat rotation curve here. And so what does this mean? How is this possible? Well, either gravity's bizarre, gravity does not work the way we understand it, um, tough luck, Isaac Newton, um, which is not our, key, key, that's not our best idea. I guess it's possible, but that, that's not our best idea. Gravity works pretty well in the solar system and all this sort of thing, so we think we, think we understand gravity pretty well, um, unless it changes on large scales. But the other thing is, okay, the only way to make this happen is if most of the mass is not in the center. That instead, the mass is spread throughout a galaxy and that there's more and more and more mass as you get farther and farther from the center. That most of the mass is far from the center. But there aren't, most of the stars are not far from the center. And so you run the numbers and you do the calculations. And so what this, this makes sense, you know, unless we throw out our theories of gravity, this makes sense only if most of the mass is not at the center. Most of the mass, most of the stars are at the center, so that means most of the mass are not stars. You start running the numbers, you start calculating, and again, you get about a factor of 10. Cool. So this gets, this really gets scientists' attention. And then as people start studying galaxy clusters more, again, now we're <laughs> generations after Fritz Zwicky, more evidence, more evidence from clusters. Uh, two other big pieces of evidence have come up. First of all, um, in a galaxy cluster, there's a lot of hot gas that fills in the space between galaxies. Hot gas is very hot, but then it's held prisoner there by the gravity. So, you know, heat pressure tends to want to push outward, and then gravity wants to hold it in there. Held by gravity, and we run the numbers, we run the equations, there's a straightforward relationship between the force of gravity pulling in and how hot the gas would be, you know, because if it would be any hotter then it would escape, and then the, the gravity is going to compress it until there's a balance between heat pressure pushing outward and uh, gravity pulling inward. Really hot gas gives off x-rays, and this stuff does, millions of degrees. This is really, 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 very low density, but very hot gas filling in the space between the galaxies in a big galaxy clusters gives off x-rays. NASA launches x-ray telescopes. Right now we've got the magnificent Chandra x-ray observatory up there. Based on the temperature of those x-rays, we can say how hot the gas is, and then based on how hot the gas is, we can say, well, how strong must gravity be in order to hold it in place? We get the same number. Ten times more mass than the galaxies. Then even better than this, we have gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing, the bending of light by galaxies. So what you got is if you got this nice big cluster of galaxies. Okay, so I'm standing here with my telescope. You got this big, rich, massive cluster of galaxies. And then there's some other galaxy off behind here. And so what happens is there's so much mass here that it bends the light from this, gra this galaxy and bends it back. So I see this galaxy, and then the light goes down this way, and it gets bent up this way. So I see this galaxy as if it's in two different directions. And then I study the spectra, and I realize it's the same galaxy. It's here and here. Oh, gosh, there must be some fantastically huge mass right smack dab in the middle. Oh, there's a big cluster there. Based on the amount of bending, we can calculate mass. And what do we get? Again, ten times more mass is there than the stars and the gas and the dust and the galaxies that we see. Four pieces of evidence. Fritz Wicks's galaxy orbital speeds, then um, x-rays from hot gas, then gravitational lensing, and plus we got Vera Rubin stuff about the orbits of stars and galaxies. All of them tell us the same thing. There's ten times more mass out there than what we see. What is it? Nobody knows. We've ruled out all kinds of strange types of stars. The bright now, the best hypothesis is that it's made of some type of subatomic particles. Not neutrons, protons, and electrons, but individual particles which are so small and nobody's ever detected them, and, but they're, they're, there's just tons of them out there. Uh, it's very... Un I'm not happy with that hypothesis, but it's the best we've got. It's a huge, giant, unsolved mystery. So hopefully someday we will discover what dark matter is, but so far, we don't know.